Those of you that have made great strides into the presence of the Lord, I am attracted to the things of the Lord, living water, but you're ankle deep. Come on in. You're knee deep. Come on in. You're waist deep. Come on in. There's one more level. That's waters to swim in. So that when you leave the church, the trickle that leaves the church here in just a few moments is going to saturate marketplaces in the communities that we love. You are being sent from this sanctuary and from the sanctuary you're watching from on assignment into your community to be Jesus to as many as who will accept it. If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Prophet Ezekiel said he saw water coming out from under the church. A busted pipe? What's the problem? No, this was a vision he was having of the Spirit of the Lord. It was coming out of the church underneath the threshold, but it was a trickle. And then he said, the angel led him and said, stand in this. And he said, it was ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then waters to swim in. Those are the four saturation points of a Jesus follower today. Uh, it's possible that you have an awareness of Jesus, kind of ankle deep. Now, this is good. I'm good right here. But then there's knee deep where you come in a little further. You start engaging. You show up more. The waist deep is, you know, where you say, you know... I don't just uh, need the Lord, I desire the Lord. And it affects your giving too. Waist deep, that covers your pocketbook. <laughs> and you start giving money. When you start giving money, you know you have come into the water. But then there's that next level where you dive in. And it is waters to swim in. I'm diving in. I want everything God has for me. And so uh, during this three weeks, 21 days of prayer and fasting and the Word of God, we have decided to use some spiritual disciplines just as vehicles that get us into deep water. Spiritual disciplines produce spiritual transformation. Would you read that with me? Spiritual disciplines produce. That's right. Spiritual dif uh, disciplines are not, not salvific. They're not meritorious. Uh, these disciplines don't make God love you any more than he loves you right now. And they have nothing to do with your salvation. They are just vehicles that you get in, these spiritual disciplines that take you further into the presence of the Lord. Spiritual disciplines make room for the presence of God, room in your heart. So let's solve this algebraic equation. You ready? Did you know algebra was going to be required today? P15, F1, D1, L1, and you say P15. <laughs> let's try it again. P15. <laughs> Those are the spiritual disciplines that we're using to go into deep water into the presence of the Lord. What is P15? That's right. We're going to pray 15 minutes every day. Now, some of you, you tried it. You're like, ah, skipped a day or whatever. It's okay. Let's get back in. This is our second week. I want you to take 15 minutes and pray every day, just, just wherever that is, in your car, in your house, at the coffee shop, wherever you are. Pray 15 minutes a day. You can pray more, pray more. Then there's F1, and that's fast one day a week. I love that. You just choose a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever, and fast. You can choose multiple days. Fasting uh, is the slowest thing that you will ever do. Uh, a man uh, told me first time he had fasted, and he said, I, I thought I was going to have to go to the emergency room. <laughs> I said, what time did you break your fast? He said, two o'clock. <laughs> I said, that's awesome. You're building up your muscles. That's wonderful. Wonderful. D1, download the YouVersion app and create a plan to read the Bible every day. And then L1 is join a life group. Life group. I want you to use these as vehicles just to make room in your heart 
before the presence of the Lord. Life can get overcrowded in us sometimes in our overscheduled lives, particularly if you have young children, my goodness. Uh, sometimes it's just it's hard to breathe. These disciplines will create room in your heart for the presence of God. Oh, little town of how still we see thee. Haven't sung that song in a couple of months. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Some think Jesus grew up in Bethlehem, but he didn't. He was born in Bethlehem. He was actually raised from a, a small child up uh, until he went into ministry in a place called Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem, 90 miles to the north, he was raised in Nazareth. But in Nazareth, even though he grew up there, he didn't do his ministry there. That was in a place 25 miles to the west called Capernaum. Capernaum was in the middle of a major trade route, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It was like their, uh, their, their world wide web, like their internet. Whatever happened in that major trade, uh, trade route went to Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so when Jesus decided he would do his ministry in uh, Capernaum, everything he did got, it, was, it just blew up. Uh, Jesus went away from Nazareth. He, although he grew up there, he didn't do his ministry there. That was in Capernaum. But there was a hunger in him to go back home. I, I know some of you. You were raised in uh, little cities, uh, little towns. Uh, Capernaum, by the way, when Jesus was living there, was about 20 families. That's it. It was just a small village. But by the time Jesus comes back, it's a couple of hundred. So it's still pretty small. Some of you have come from small towns. How many of you come from small towns? Yes, you do. But you leave those small towns and you go and you uh, experience life, and with your skill set, you do some pretty amazing things. You have done some pretty amazing things. It's always just a, a kind of an innate desire to go back to your hometown and be celebrated. And I think Jesus wanted to be celebrated in his hometown. He told his disciples, I'm going back home going to be homecoming. And I'm sure the disciples thought, well, they're going to roll out the red carpet. There's going to be a parade. This is Jesus who has, uh, he is rock star status. I mean, he can't go anywhere without people knowing who he is. He's going to go back home to this little village. They're going to go crazy for him. You know, if you've gone to a little town, you've seen little plaques of so famous persons from here. You remember this lady? This is Miranda Lambert, the, ta the house that built me. And she's from where? Lindale, East Texas. And then what about this? This is LBJ, our president. Uh, he's not too far from where I'm standing right now, his hometown in Johnson City. And what about this guy? I'm all shook up. Tupelo, Mississippi, and little towns tend to celebrate people that come from that town and go on to do great things. So you would expect Jesus is about to have a homecoming. He takes his band of brothers with him because Jesus is a rabbi. Jesus is a rabbi, and a rabbi means teacher. Jesus is always teaching us something. And he brings his band of brothers because he wants to show them something. But what? Matthew 6 and 1. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to where? Nazareth. And what's Nazareth? His hometown. The next Sabbath, the preacher invited him to begin teaching in the synagogue. I would love to announce to you like... Next Sunday, Jesus will be here preaching. That would be awesome. And many in his hometown who heard him were what? Amazed. And they asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then 
they scoffed. Now, this is a right-hand turn. Nobody saw this coming. They were amazed when he was preaching. They saw power in his miracles, and then it takes a hard right turn, a dark right turn. Then they scoffed, and here's what they said. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary. That was so offensive. Uh, in in <clears throat> Jewish culture, you never said son of the mother. It was always son of the father. Should have been son of Joseph. But they are so offended at him that they say son of Mary. And then they say the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon. Did you know that, that Jesus had at least six brothers and sisters? Did you know that? I think sometimes we're taught, you know, Mary uh, just had Jesus, that's it. No, James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and sisters, plural. And they live right here among us. We know his people. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. What just happened? They were offended at him. Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. That's true, isn't it? And here's one of the saddest parts of this whole story. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them. How sad. Except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He did what he could. And Jesus was amazed. They were amazed at his teaching, and Jesus was amazed at something completely different. What? I cannot believe they don't believe in me. And it was unbelief that stopped him from being able to do what he want, wanted to do. Unbelief restricts the power of God. Unbelief restricts the power of God. You mean God, who has all power? Yes, is limited by unbelief. Faith amazes Jesus Christ. Lack of it and great faith. It, it, he, he goes on record in the scripture to say, I'm amazed. Uh, on the scale of faith, on one end would be great faith. Uh, this is recorded in Matthew and Luke. There was a centurion, a Roman centurion, not a Jewish man. He didn't have the, the, uh, the privilege of, of, of the history of the Jews or the covenant of the Jews, or the scriptures of the Jews. He, he just, he's a pagan. He's a Roman centurion. In other words, he was over a hundred soldiers. And he, for some reason, uh, eyewitnesses Jesus Christ. And this Roman centurion, one of his employees gets deathly sick. And he goes to Jesus, a pagan man, and says, can you heal my servant? And the Lord said, well, sure, I'll come to your house, which was forbidden. But Jesus, you know Jesus. He going to do stuff, make everybody uncomfortable. And uh, Jesus says, I'll come to your house. The Roman centurion says, no, no, you don't have to come to my house. You just speak the word and my servant will be here, heard and healed. And, and Jesus is stunned. He goes on record in Matthew and Luke saying he was stunned by this man's faith. And he said, I haven't seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. What in the world? He goes on record to say great faith amazes me. And he goes on record to say lack of faith or disbelief or unbelief amazes me. I am amazed that I came back to my own hometown and you didn't believe in me. You know, Jesus found more acceptance with pagans than he did his own people. How is that possible? Those he grew up with did not see him as a miracle worker. They saw him as one of us. His sisters are here. His brothers are here. He is the son of of Mary. They were just, the Bible says they were absolutely offended. Fulfilling the scripture, he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. Let me tell you something. When you begin to dive into deep waters and when you begin to declare, God, I want all that you have for me. 
I want your Holy Spirit vibrant in my life, vibrant in my marriage, vibrant how I handle money, vibrant how I manage people, vibrant how I do my practice. And when you get into those deep waters and the Holy Spirit is moving through you everywhere you go, not everybody is going to celebrate you. Now, you'll be accepted by a stranger, by a coworker, by a neighbor, but the people you're closest to may not celebrate you. I don't like this transformation that you're going through. Uh, and there's something about us that wants, deeply wants to be accepted about those that we love the most. There are men here in the sound of my voice at all of our six campuses. There are men who are still trying to prove to their dad who's been gone for years that they have what it takes. It's just something innate about us. We want the people closest to us to believe in us, to say, you did good. I'm proud of you. There is within every man and every woman a natural innate wiring for those that we grew up with to say, I'm proud of you. You have done something significant. And when they don't, it is a terrible, terrible rejection. Unbelief restricts the power of God. I would imagine when Jesus was bringing his band of brothers back to his hometown, uh, he being God knew that there were multiple outcomes depending on how his, the people accepted him. But I imagine Jesus wanted to go back to his hometown to heal the blind boy he grew up with, who's now a grown man, to heal the little girl that he grew up with that was crippled. I imagine Jesus wanted to come back to his hometown and set things straight, but they would not receive him. Why wouldn't they receive him? They had trouble seeing Jesus as divine because they had seen Jesus in diapers. They had trouble seeing Jesus as God when they saw him graduate. The people close to you are sometimes the people that keep you from, from transforming into the person God wants for you. And it's a sad thing. He couldn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And because of their unbelief, the scripture says, he couldn't do any miracles among them except, he said, I'll do what I can do. I'll put my hands on a few sick people and heal them. And Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Now, just a chapter earlier in the, the gospel of Mark, Jesus had just come from raising from the dead a 12-year-old girl. Do you remember how much power that took to defeat death and raise a 12? What if you're the parents of that 12-year-old girl? Are you forever grateful? Of course you are. He raises a 12-year-old girl back to life. And then he heals a lady who had been hemorrhaging to death for over a decade. He heals her. Virtue flows out of him. And now he's bringing all that power to his hometown, and he doesn't lose any of that power in his 25-mile journey along the cliffs of Arbel. When you become truly transformed and the power of God is emanating in your life, those closest to you may be the most resistant to it, but you do what you can anyway. There was a, a beautiful lady in our church, Denise and I, uh, she came up to us brokenhearted at the conclusion of service, so sad, and, and I said, how can I pray with you? And she said, well, uh, my husband uh, said, you know, we are, we're, we're pretty successful, we've, you know, we've been blessed with affluence. We've done and we've acquired and we've done things and, and, uh, and we, are, we are party animals. I mean, we are party animals. We, we party hard and we wild and crazy. And, but she said that lifestyle was wearing on me 
and, and it was causing my heart to hurt, and I stumbled into your church at the invitation of someone who invited me, and I have never experienced anything like that in my entire life. And when I got home, all I could talk about is, honey, you got to come with me. You got to see this. You got to feel this. He told me to get out. He told me he didn't like the transformation I was experiencing. He told me he didn't want that kind of girl. He wanted the girl he married, wild and crazy. Crazy Kathy. What is this church and God? And not everybody close to you will celebrate what God is doing through you. They didn't deny his miracle power. They did not deny his anointed teaching. It was just, he was one of them. Here's what I know about Jesus. He will not barge in. Jesus knocks on a closed door. He simply presents himself with all of his amazing power to heal and transform, but he will not bust the door open He simply knocks. Revelation 3 and 20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you, if you, it's conditional. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. Look what he says next. Nothing. Nothing. He goes on to say, if you don't open the door, I will not come into you. So he knocks on the door, whether you open it or not, you know, that's you. I pray that you will open the door. The Lord is knocking right now. The Lord is knocking on the door of your heart right now. Let him in. You can stay ankle deep, knee deep. You can stay waist deep. But I pray that you would dive into the things of the Lord and let him take over your life. I I want the Lord to take over my life. What is the deal with Jesus' disrespectful hometown? I'd like to give them a word. Mary's son. That's Mary's son. That's so disrespectful. They're supposed to say that's Joseph's boy. No, they said that's Mary's boy. they just cutting. You know, um, what was it, it about this little pitiful little village that they would shun? Should be a hero. Their hero, the Lord Jesus. But I don't know. I, I don't know what happened. I, I think we kind of get a sneak peek into what their problem was. Uh, when in John 1 and 45, Philip, he goes to a, a man named Nathaniel, which is also called Bartholomew. He has a couple of names in different gospels. And he told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of, so that, that's proper, from Nazareth. Go ahead. Nathaniel says, Nazareth, in my Allison uh, uh, Iverson voice, Alan Iverson voice, practice. I don't, y'all are too young for that. Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. Nazareth. And the problem with Nazareth is what, how they viewed themselves. Apparently, nothing good can come from this pitiful little village. Nazareth, well, let me just tell you something. Nazareth is not a place. Nazareth is a perspective. Nazareth is the box and the cage that people will put you in when you start to transform with the power of God. 
Nazareth is not a place, it's a perspective. They did not think, they thought he was a little too uppity. You coming back to us, all famous and everything, it was how they viewed themselves that kept Jesus from doing what Jesus wanted to do. Faith, on the other hand, releases the power of God. What releases the power of God? Faith. Faith. Everybody say faith. Faith. Releases the power of God. Why did Jesus bring his band of brothers with him to see himself embarrassed before his town's people, his people, the people he grew? Why did Jesus want eyewitnesses to this embarrassing situation because the road to spiritual transformation is paved with rejection. Rejection simply becomes a cobblestone that you put your foot on to keep moving in the right direction in Jesus Christ. Walk forward. Walk forward. Rejection teaches you where you stand. Without rejection, you will never grow into the person God wants you to become. Rejection is God's way of letting you know you're better than what you just tried to settle for. Keep moving. Rejection is actually redirection. Look what he does next in Mark 6, 7. Jesus is humiliated by his own townspeople. Humiliated. And what's the very next thing he does? On the way out of town, he said, well, I'm going to do what I do. Limited, but I'm going to do what He said he healed a few people. I wonder what those people thought about him. On my way out of town, I'm going to heal a few people. And then he calls all of his people together, Mark 6 and 7. He called the 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. Look what happens. So the disciples went out. Now, they had just seen this great rejection. The disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and to turn to God. Hallelujah. And they cast out, they cast out. These are engineers, attorneys, fishermen, investment people, bankers, administrators. These are not seminarians. These are not seminar. These are not preacher's kids. They're not that. These are people just attracted to Jesus that want to dive in. And Jesus says, you know the authority I have? I'm about to give that to you. And through their hands, sick people were healed. And they were anointing them with olive oil. Those of you that have made great strides into the presence of the Lord, I am attracted to the things of the Lord, living water. But your ankle deep, come on in. Your knee deep. Come on in. Your waist deep. Come on in. There's one more level. That's waters to swim in. So that when you leave the church, the trickle that leaves the church here in just a few moments is going to saturate marketplaces in the communities that we love. You are being sent from this sanctuary and from the sanctuary you're watching from, on assignment into your community to be Jesus to as many as who will accept it. The people that are going to resist you the most is Wow Willie. You used to hang out with. He's not going to like the change in you, but that's all right. You just keep changing. Do it. Anyway, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yes, it can. The Lord Jesus Christ. What is Nazareth for you? It is the place where people underestimated you, talked down to you, caged you, limited you. I am asking you in the name of Jesus, keep moving into the water. Dive in and watch God do something wonderful through your life. 
to the people that you love. Oh, let's praise the Lord together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. And we hope and pray that this message touched your heart. And we wanna hear from you. We want to get to know you. There are several links below this video that you can connect and let us know what's going on in your life. So we would love to invite you to do that. But most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, that is amazing and we want to celebrate you. I invite you to text next steps to 22999. We'll respond with a text and give you some resources and next steps for your faith journey. So we just celebrate you and want to uh, invite you to do that. Thank you so much for making this decision to follow Jesus, it's amazing. So thank you again for being a part of our service today. We will see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.